how sleep tokens take me back to Eden converted me to worship her. Is the hype real? Well, if you had asked me that very question no less than a week ago, I would have said absolutely not. Sleep token is the most overrated act in the metal slash metal adjacent scene right now. That opinion has changed, and it's probably the most off guard I've been caught by pretty much anything in a good long while, especially where music is concerned. I don't think I've been so resigned to disliking an album and come out with having had such a different experience from the expectation as I did with this one. Sure, there have been times when I thought I'd feel fairly meh or broadly mediocre about a record and come out pleasantly surprised. There have also been countless times I've been excited and come out a bit disappointed just to get used to the record over time or come back later and discover I actually love it. But never has that feeling slapped me in the face so unbelievably strong. Not just in recent memory, but never in memory at all. Take Me Back to Eden is an album that is fully greater than the sum of its parts, especially when you consider the general quality of the deep cuts on the record, basically the whole back half of the album, compared to the singles, because truly, truly, every one of these non-singles is perfect, and they move mountains to improve the quality of the singles in hindsight, and to round out the amazement factor of the album. More on this particular aspect in parts 2 and 3. Looking at the record while I wrote this introduction, one of the few moments I hadn't been actively listening to something from this album since I fell in love with it, I am continually astonished by how addicted I became to it over the past week, and how willing I was to just replay it. Over, and over, and over. Several songs have been on perpetual replay for what feels like a millennium, and I feel like I could continue to do so for an eon. But hey, given that I feel like I'm basically just skirting around my words right now, not wanting to give away anything to come over the course of the review in this introduction, I suppose I can just go ahead and tell you the story of how Sleep Tokens Take Me Back to Eden converted me to worshipper. I'm one of the people who had basically no idea who Sleep Token was until about January 2023 or so very recently, and even then I only vaguely understood that a lot of people were hyping them up and that I had never heard of them. I didn't go out of my way to listen to them either. But then came February 2023 and my virgin taking experience with the band. It, well, maybe that sentence sounds a little weird, but considering how implicitly sexual this album is at several points and how horny everybody apparently is for Vessel, the band's vocalist, I suppose it's still an apt metaphor, or maybe that's just me trying to justify a truly horrifically written poor excuse for a sentence, but I'm just going to act like it's completely normal. Back in February, Vore released the fifth single for Take Me Back to Eden. The song blew up even more in my personal music spheres than previous singles had. The song also had another thing going for it. People were raving about how heavy it was. Heaviest song since Gods and all that fancy whatnot. I obviously hadn't listened to any songs from the band prior, so I had no context or idea what that meant, but if people in the metalcore and deathcore reaction communities were raving about it, I figured it was going to be sufficiently heavy. So I took a chance. I wasn't impressed. Or at least I wasn't nearly as impressed as I felt like I should have been, which was almost worse. Rather than the song and band just not being for me, I felt like it should have been for me but just wasn't. It confused me a bit, so I listened a few times with reactors on YouTube, Nick Nocturnal and Metal Burb come to mind, and I admit I got into it a little bit more, but still wasn't in love. I thought that some of the musicality was intriguing and interesting, although not all of it landed. I thought Vessel's voice was interesting, but not fitting, a bit too much projection and sexiness I guess in the cleans, and a bit too quiet and thin in the uncleans considering how low it was in the mix. As a first-time encounter, his vocals seemed clearly to be an acquired taste that I had not acquired yet, as I noted so many people loving it, but I just wasn't understanding. I didn't hate the song, but there wasn't anything about it that would have led me to play it repeatedly, and definitely not to feel inclined to share it, praise it, or agree that the band's blowing up made any sense. But with that being said... I knew they deserved another chance. Maybe Vore, despite being potentially Sleep Token's heaviest song based on what people were saying and my tendency to prefer heavier material from bands that dabble in it, maybe it just wasn't for me. 
I found on Spotify that there were four other singles already, which, by the way, as a side note, is kind of dumb. Releasing half of an album as singles is never something I've been a fan of, even if it's technically better for marketing or whatnot these days. So that night, I listened to all five singles in a row. I was even less impressed. Vor turned out being the only one I liked overall. Sure, The Summoning and Granite had portions I liked when they dabbled in the heaviness, but generally speaking, I was thoroughly unenthused, especially by Chokehold, which had a lot of other weird stuff in it, and Aquaregia, which just seemed like a big old nothing burger despite its interesting elements that seemed like nothing interesting actually happening. I know that makes no sense, but that's exactly how I felt. Let's just say that all of my expectations were in the wrong place. Sure, Vor was not 100% balls to the wall heavy, so it being notable for being heavy should have led for me to expect other songs to, well, not be as heavy, but I guess I still thought they would be something like Vor was. At the very least, I wanted them to sound more like Vor, even if Vor already wasn't exactly a notable track to me. By this point, I was over it. I had given Sleep Token their chance, and I hadn't been impressed, so I just kind of gave up. I didn't listen to any of their older material, I didn't replay any of those 2023 singles, I ignored any and all discussion about the band, because who am I to be a wet blanket? Who am I to be the odd man out and tell everybody I didn't understand the hype when they were all clearly loving it? Sleep Token just wasn't for me, and that was the end of it. Fast forward to April 2023, and various reactions to a couple of Sleep Token singles by Will Ramos of Lorna Shore fame, with the charismatic voice on YouTube, and another one with those two, but also with Chris Lipe for the tracks Chokehold and The Summoning. For some unknown reason, I still couldn't get into the music watching these reactions. Reactions by people who often can make me appreciate or enjoy music I otherwise wouldn't. It was so rough that I didn't even finish one of the videos, I was just so incredibly disinterested in the music that it wasn't worth my time. This time, that was actually the end of it. I had briefly considered giving the full album a listen just to see what happened since by then the release date had been announced, but there was a problem. There was no hype, there was no excitement, there wasn't even any anticipation. Even for releases I'm actively dreading, there's still some anticipation for what I might get out of it, you know? The sixth and final single, Do You Wish That You Loved Me, released somewhere in this approximate time period. I didn't give it a listen, didn't even care to after I heard General Sentiment, for it was pretty mixed compared to the overall standard of the previous tracks. I did think twice about it, but then no more. I honestly forgot the band existed for a few weeks. So May 19th came and went. Take Me Back to Eden dropped and I didn't make time to listen to the girthy 63 minute runtime the album was. The fact that the very five singles I didn't enjoy were the first five songs in the album did a lot to make me subconsciously avoid it too. I figured it'd be an uphill battle immediately and didn't care to force it, so I ignored it instead. But I did continue to see hype. I saw so many people continuing to rave. Needless to say, I was dubious, since that's what sentiment was like for the singles too, so I again didn't really give it a second thought. But I did watch one brief review of it that kind of outlined a few points about individual tracks and the moods and atmospheres they provided though. This was on May 22nd, three days after the Take Me Back to Eden release. I finally relented, thinking something along the lines of, eh, I might as well get it over with. No use criticizing the band or the album saying they're not for me if I did even give the whole record a fair shake. So I finally listened to it that evening, start to finish, no preconceptions, just letting the music wash over me and be whatever it wanted to be without forcing a standard of quality or style or any form of expectations at all onto it. The first thing that I noticed was that I didn't dislike the singles nearly as much as I did the first one or two times I tried them a few months prior. The second thing that I noticed was that I maybe actually liked the singles? Maybe a little bit? Hmm, that's weird. Then came the back half of the album. The final seven tracks, the deep cuts, the non-singles, as I'll refer to them. Do You Wish That You Loved Me was a single, yes, but since I didn't listen to it when it first dropped, I didn't think of it as one. Side note. For the remainder of this review, when I refer to the back half of the album, or some variation of that phrase, the deep cuts, or the non-singles, I'm referring to the whole tracklist from Ascensionism to Euclid. 
When I say the back half of this album blew me out of the water, I mean it. Ascensionism has just about everything a song could have without relegating itself to simply throwing anything and everything at the wall and hoping it sticks. It seamlessly flows from one part to the next, going from huge feels or reels vibes in a haunting piano melody that makes you want to cry, to a weird rap adjacent section with bars that actually really caught me off guard the first time, but are in fact incredibly catchy and flow really well. Then it starts to build tension and release it with some guitars and some heavier tendencies which build up to an incredibly aggressive climax and the line, You're gonna watch me ascend, screamed by Vessel in the middle of it, an absolutely banger breakdown moment, a moment that a friend of mine actually said, gives you no choice but to die. Only to resolve back into the gut-wrenchingly depressing intro again with adjusted lyrics that, again, make you want to cry yourself to sleep. But wait, there's more. It goes from there into a gut-wrenching, heavier moment again with the lines, You make me wish I could disappear, sung in a way that Vessel doesn't do anywhere else on the album. What a track. Are You Really Okay is just heartbreaking, man. It's nowhere near as dynamic or proggy in the way that several other tracks on the album are, but it hits every neurotically emotional part of me with an ease that few songs can these days. Imagine pleading with a loved one just to tell you the truth, begging them to not hurt themselves when you discover just how much they are drowning. That's the emotion that riddles the song through the incredibly depressing acoustic guitar melody accompanying potentially Vessel's most expressively sad vocal delivery on the record. There's not much I can say to explain this track, as most of it comes down to how it just punches you in the gut and tears your heart out of your chest. I imagine the song will see many a person bawling to it in their worst moments, both those experiencing the negative emotions and those watching their loved ones go through it. The apparition was done dirty, not being one of the singles, to be honest. It's not necessarily as interesting or dynamic as Chokehold or The Summoning are, but it's so much of a bop in ways that, say, Aqua Regia couldn't be that it absolutely deserves to be a single. Hey, I love Aqua Regia too, but you know it's true. It's a little bit more on the simplistic side where the album is concerned, but the balance between the moody tones of the instrumentals with one of the best sets of lyrics on the record and potentially the most catchy verse performances, well, and the chorus too actually on Vessel's part just blends so perfectly. Besides, that synth melody that permeates through the entire track? Fire. Absolutely fire. This entire track is one of many examples of the band's drums perfectly fitting into the songs without stealing the show. The drummer never underplays when he's going all out, but he never makes the show all about him. His energy is so on point here and everywhere else. Do You Wish That You Loved Me, I mentioned earlier, I didn't listen to as a single, but as a track on the record, it is so brilliant I can't even express it. Like, how could anybody be saying anything bad about this track as a single? Ignore the fact that I wasn't initially impressed with any of the singles. Structurally, Do You Wish That You Loved Me follows somewhat after Are You Really Okay, but it never feels the same. The tone and the vibe is so incredibly different, targeting a love lost rather than a love losing itself. The melodies are repetitive, granted, but the lyrics are just so incredibly good, and if you listen to the song with an introspective approach, you're bound to be sucker punched by at least a couple of the lines. It's potentially the most simple song, really leaning into its poppy elements, but it is no less impactful or beautiful because of it. Rain, I can tell, is the sleeper hit of the album. It's a song that I think everybody is going to remember is incredibly high quality, a song they remember they love every time they listen to it, but then somehow forget it exists while it's not actively playing. With that being said, I see no chance the song doesn't become a staple of live shows. It's so catchy, moody, and has wonderful balance between the sadness and the hope that tinges the edges of it. This song has easily my favorite chorus melodically, easily the catchiest verse, made only more catchy because of the drums and low-tuned guitar joining it in layers after each phrase. This is such a brilliant song with excellent vocal delivery and the best backing instruments throughout. Easily a top three track on the album, and I will not have it be slandered as being anything less. Take Me Back to Eden may not have everything that Ascensionism does, but it is a build-up unlike any other. 
The song actually kind of has two climaxes, though anybody who's heard the song knows that the second one, which culminates in a minute-long breakdown at the very end of the song that absolutely melts your face off, is the more notable one. The tone and conceptual ideas behind the song are wonderful, offset by eerily beautiful but haunting guitar melodies in the background through the first couple minutes, moving into a semi-climax before the halfway point of the song, resolving in a tense and eerie near silence for a short time which becomes a rap verse. This portion of the song is something that also seems like it absolutely shouldn't fit, but absolutely does, and flows directly into the chorus yet again perfectly. Follow this with a brief piano break and an incredibly beautiful bridge that has some of my favorite lyrics on the entire record, and just, wow. Wonderful stuff. But wait, the last chorus and the instrumentals that accompany are a culmination that makes the whole previous six or six and a half minutes just that much better. And then that breakdown, dude, like one minute you're just vibing, wondering where the buildup and the instruments is going, and then all of a sudden, where did my face go? You have suddenly gone into such an intense stink face mode that your face has pretty much melted off. Sure, I don't love the fade out ending, I tend to hate fade outs, but for some reason, I never find myself holding it against this masterwork of a track. But then Euclid. What a closer. I've heard it calls back to the band's 2019 Sundowning album, but since I haven't listened to it, I won't comment on that aspect. All I know is this song is so haunting, so catchy, so, so beautiful, so cathartic, so incredible. Following Take Me Back to Eden, it's hard to believe there's a better closer that exists, but it absolutely does, and Euclid is it. Euclid is easily my favorite track on the album, and I've almost cried to it multiple times, for different reasons and at different points nearly every time. I wish I had the words to describe how much I love this song, but I just don't. You owe it to yourself to sit in a dark room with your eyes closed and just let Euclid wash over you. Even the semi-unresolved conclusion in the last few seconds is done perfectly, partially because what it does is make me want to replay the whole album over again. What a track. What an album. So here's the deal. I was a certified Sleep Token hater prior to May 22nd. Vor was my first single, and I thought it was a fine song, but when I went back to listen to the four previous singles, they didn't do anything for me. I didn't even bother to listen to Do You Wish That You Loved Me as a single, even though there was part of me that was curious when I saw General Sentiment wasn't quite as high for it as other singles. As a result, when I finally listened to the album, I did it very hesitantly, just to get it over with, you know? Fine, what do I have to lose? Maybe there will be another song I enjoy or something. The non-singles, the back half of the album, whatever, are perfection. Absolute perfection. Every moment that I'm not listening to this album, though specifically the deep cuts in the back half, I feel like I am doing something wrong. It's all that my mind has been on for the past several days. I am now a convert. This album is so incredibly good, so beautiful. I spent all day on May 23rd gushing about this record and this band to literally everybody who would listen. Prior, I did not get any of the hype at all, and I just thought these guys were not my thing. No longer. Those deep cuts also did something incredible in that they made all of those five singles I heard but hadn't really loved previously better in hindsight. I no longer dislike them. In fact, I really like them, even love a few of them. And more than all of that, every time I listen to the album, it seems like a different song hits the hardest or catches my attention the most. It's so versatile and molds itself to how I'm feeling in any given moment like nothing else I've ever listened to and I have to give it credit for being able to do that. Several of these tracks are going to be on perpetual repeat, probably for the rest of my life. I genuinely don't understand how this happened. How did I go from indifferent at best to singing the praises with everybody else? How did everything about my perception and understanding of this band change in a single half hour? Sleep Tokens Take Me Back to Eden finally converted me to worshipper.